not tell you what I think it looks like. <laughs> uh, I won't ask. Hello and welcome to the Royal Institution in London, uh, the home of, of science in the UK and a very historic building where lots of firsts in science have been presented. Um, so it's a real privilege to be here and even more so that I'm here with Zabina Hossenfelder, who's a physicist. A lot of you will also know her from her fantastic YouTube channel where she talks about lots of different scientific uh, topics uh, with her own unique brand of, of humour and, and uh, has got a great knack of cutting through the BS. Um, so she's very kindly, I'm, I'm, I'm very honoured to be sharing the stage with her, uh, agreed to a couple of videos, the first of which is on her channel where I asked her some idiotic questions about physics and she's now going to ask me some questions about medicine which I'm sure won't be idiotic, so, so please Zabina, uh, fire away. I once had an echocardiogram done and the cardiologist went on and on about how the heart supposedly has five chambers instead of four. Okay. Is this a real thing or is it like the fifth force in physics that doesn't actually exist? Right. Yeah, I think it's probably the latter there. Um, I'm not really sure what he was going on about. There was, there was a kids TV cartoo uh, cartoon um, called Captain Planet. I don't know if it ever made it to Germany. It was teaching kids to be um, aware of pollution. So there were four kind of young people that would help, help Captain Planet who were Earth wind, fire and water. And then this fifth one, the fifth force that would summon Captain Planet was called Heart. Um, so I don't know if maybe this guy was just a fan of, of Captain Planet, but no, the, the, the heart has, has four chambers. You were having an echocardiogram, which is a, an ultrasound of the heart, and there is a view that we, we use called the five chamber view, um, but it's, it's, not, it's a misnomer. It's, it's four chambers plus the aorta which is the, the blood vessel leaving the heart. And it's just referred to in shorthand as, as the five chamber view, but the heart definitely doesn't have five chambers. The mammalian and, and, and bird heart, our hearts has, uh, um, have four chambers, but then reptilian hearts have three, some fish have two. So there are different uh, variations, but they all are lower than four. That was probably what he was referring to. So it's good to know that I was afraid I might have to look for a new cardiologist. <laughs> Well, or maybe you're a, uh, a unique um, individual with a, with a fifth chamber. Who knows? <laughs> I, I may be weird, but not that weird. But I have another heart question. Is it, is it right that the heart actually contracts this way rather than that way? I saw this in a video. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a fantastic question because that, that is um, the topic of a lot of, a lot of research in, in, in cardiology. And you're quite right to say that the heart doesn't just squeeze in this kind of very, you know, most animations that you, you, you see online um, give this quite simplistic idea that the heart's just kind of squeezing like this. And certainly if you look up sort of stock, stock video, you know, I sometimes want to put an animation of a heart and they're all, they're all wrong. They, they all get it completely wrong. Not only with, with the simplifying how it squeezes, but also how the whole heart moves um, when it beats. So these animations will often show the heart kind of pumping like this with, with, the, with the fat bit staying still and, and, the, and the pointy bit coming up to, the, to where that is. But that's actually the opposite way around. So the, the bottom bit of the heart, that pointed bit, actually stays pretty still and the rest of the heart, including all the, the great vessels coming off the top of the heart, all move up and down. So, so first of all, that movement is depicted wrongly a lot of the time. But in answer to your question, the heart does this kind of ringing uh, maneuver. And this is because of its anatomy. So the heart is a very complicated, uh, has got some very complicated geometry. It's essentially sort of contained by uh, a single muscular band, which undergoes this very kind of clever origami process. And it's, it's a double spiral that loops around and then twists so that the whole sort of conical structure of, of the heart is, is bound by this muscular band. And then around that, there are three layers of, of muscle that move um, with some degree of independence. 
all forming uh, the, the contracting motion. And I don't know if you know, there's a, a famous building in London skyline called the Gherkin, um, which is quite a good representation of how these, these fi- uh, different uh, muscle sheets are aligned. Because on the inside of the heart, you've got a longitudinal uh, muscle that, that makes the heart go like this. Then the next layer out, you've got a circumferential uh, layer, which squeezes like this. So that goes around the heart. And then on the outside of the heart, you've got this kind of diagonal um, muscle, uh, muscle fibers. And that causes that sort of twisting motion. And all three of those layers working together creates this very sophisticated and quite complicated pumping motion. The mistake I think a lot of us make is trying to apply some of our um, imaging techniques, which are for the most part two-dimensional, as representations of what's actually happening. So you can measure, you know, an X and Y axis and, and get two views of the heart, but you're still extrapolating to this this kind of very idealized shape, and that's not what happens when when the heart contracts. It really changes shape quite a lot. The research I, I, I kind of alluded to um, initially is a lot of changes that occur in heart failure, which is where the heart stops beating as well as it should be, are very subtle and, and they don't necessarily show up if you just look at those, those two-dimensional projections. So what we try to do now is actually look at that torsion, the twisting motion of the heart, because that's a very sensitive um, marker of, of dysfunction in the heart. And, and that's, so it, in, in, in answer to your question, that's correct, that the heart doesn't beat in that simplistic way. And actually it's, it's uh, an area of a lot of interest. <laughs> well, that is more complicated than quantizing gravity. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of up and down motion, this brings to my mind another question. I read that you're not supposed to do CPR on a bed, which brings up the question, like, how does an average woman like me get an adult man out of bed quickly without breaking his neck? Um asking for a friend. <laughs> right, okay, fine, just just hypothetically here, right. Yeah, I, I mean, famously, whenever I attend a cardiac arrest in the hospital, if the patient's in a bed, I just go, sorry, we can't, we can't do anything here, and we just walk away, and, that, and that, that's one of the rules of CPR. Uh, I think probably what you've heard is, if you can move a patient safely to a hard surface, then CPR will be much more effective. If, if they're in a soft bed, obviously, if you're pushing down, the, the intention with CPR is to depress the, the sternum by a good, you know, five, six centimeters in the average size person. And you've got to push pretty hard to do that. And, you know, the rib cage is, is quite stiff. I'm not hitting my microphone, am I? Um, and so if the mattress is, is soft, you'll just push the whole person down. You won't achieve much in the way of CPR. Um, physics. It's, that's physics. That is physics, exactly. Well, so much of, of what uh, we do is based on physics, really. But it is also important to maintain your own uh, safety and, and you know not inflict damage on on this hypothetical person by breaking their neck. So you know if, if there's a, a a big guy in bed, then and 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 they've suffered a cardiac arrest, then you just do CPR where they are if if you can't safely move them. Uh, the hospital beds are, are quite clever in that we can just hit a button and then all the air will come out of the mattress immediately and then we'll be back on, on the firm sort of metal bit of the, of the bed. So they've got built-in kind of CPR readiness. But yeah, I mean, it, it, you've got to put a lot of force in and, it, and it's pretty common to crack ribs when you're doing CPR and that tends to mean that you, you're doing a good job. So you can tell that to your friend. Maybe they need a new bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any favorite surgery? I think it would be tempting to say one from my own field, but I think that's probably a, a little biased. Um, so I'll, I'll mention one which I think is really interesting from, from the, the, the world of, of cardiology and, and cardiac surgery, um, which isn't done very much these days, uh, and that's the heterotopic heart transplant, or sometimes called the piggyback heart. It uh, is where the, uh, a failing heart, so it's heart which has got heart failure, which we mentioned earlier, so it's not beating very well, is no longer able to, to do the job that it needs to. And instead of removing it, like in a heart transplant and putting a new one in, you put a second heart in alongside it. So you're actually connecting it in parallel. It's gone out of fashion really in the West. It's not done very often, but it, it leads to a, a very 
devious question for the, the new doctors when I, I give them a heart tracing and I say, right, what's the problem here? And they're scratching their heads for ages and they can't work it out. And they go, I don't know, I just can't, it seems to be sort of different, different morphologies to this. Uh, they don't know that the patient's got two hearts and that's why there are two different heart tracings there. From outside my field, which I find completely amazing because it's just a reflection of sometimes very novel thinking. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. I don't know how well known it is outside medical circles, something called rotation plasty. So this is where you may have a bone cancer, something like a, a Ewing sarcoma. So, so it's cancer that affects, say, around the knee. So they have to remove that part of the, the bone, but the distal leg, the, the foot and everything is fine. So it's, you know, it's a real shame to lose healthy tissue. So you remove the cancer spot, but obviously the knee joint has gone. And having an amputation above the knee versus below the knee makes a huge difference in terms of the, the, the function the person can have. So a rotation plus is where they, they put the ankle joint in place of the knee joint. So the, the um, uh, just proximal to the ankle is, is um, uh, anastomose to the, to the femur. And then you've got a backwards foot, so it's pointing the wrong way, uh, with the ankle joint acting as the knee joint. Um, and then you can fit prostheses on and, and they can lead a, a very normal life. So that I think is just, I don't know how somebody came up with that, but when I first heard about it, I thought, wow, that's just really unique, clever thinking. So I, I didn't know the word, but uh, I've seen a video of this. Mm. Um, it's it's and strange to look at, isn't it? Because their foot's on backwards and in the wrong place. But um, once you get past that, it's, it's really effective. Speaking of watching videos of weird things, um, I like to watch videos of surgery. Do you think that's weird? Yes. So uh, we were already talking about heart transplantation. Uh, why is it that we still don't have an artificial heart? I mean, it's just, it's just a pump. <laughs> like, how hard can it be? Well, I thought we've already established that it's not just a pump, but uh, no, you're, you're, you're quite right in that it does feel like we should have developed an artificial heart by now because we had the first sort of working prototypes of this almost 50 years ago now, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, right around the time the first heart transplant was taking place in 1967, very soon afterwards, we'd put in um, we, the royal we, I wasn't even born, uh, ventricular assist devices, uh, which are not heart replacements, but these, these devices to, to augment pumping function. So they, the heart remains in place. And, and again, similar to, to the heterotopic heart transplant, they're connected in parallel. Um, and they have become really good now. So the, the first device was mostly externalized. It was a huge, noisy thing like this with a massive battery pack or you know, very limited battery life. To be perfectly frank, it was a miserable existence. You know, um, it didn't really restore any quality of life, which is, of course, the whole point of medicine is, is to, to give people not just lifespan, but, but health span to give them a good life. And because that's got a lot better, I guess some of the impetus to, to develop a fully artificial replacement heart has, has reduced because we've got this good technology that does a, a reasonable job. But there are still patients for whom a ventricular assist device isn't sufficient who would benefit from an artificial heart. And there are still companies um, trying to develop an artificial heart. In fact, I was gonna go and visit a factory in Sweden. I had it all planned out until COVID happened and, and make a video from there. And the reason is, is because it's actually a lot more complex than it initially appears to be. First of all, there's something about um, pulsatile flow that seems to be very important. So these assist devices that I've talked about, so now they're, they're, they're really small. They, they're, they're like um, a sort of tube with an impeller inside or, or sometimes a, a, a centrifugal pump um, arrangement with a single moving part, just this impeller magnetically levitated going around uh, very fast. So you get a continuous blood flow. So if you feel these patients pulse, they won't have a pulse. So that's another thing I, I do to the junior doctors to, to, to trick them up. Uh, that's the, I think a lot of my motivation is just trying to Trip up, trip up junior doctors. Um, so they won't have any pulse at all. And that unexpectedly has got some weird phenomena surrounding it. So when you don't have a pulse, we see patients tend to bleed more um, and there's some sort of abnormal 
clotting that seems to occur, the tissue beds, uh, the vascular beds themselves start behaving a bit differently. And the, the bleeding thing is important because these patients are on anticoagulation because they've got a prosthetic device in. And the, you know, these impellers are turning several thousand RPM. So that also sort of starts mashing up blood cells and, and clotting factors. So it's a real sort of combination of very bad things. So, so bleeding is one of the main complications of these devices. Plus the heart isn't just a pump, it's also an endocrine organ. It's, it um, has a very uh, complicated nervous system and these things aren't, aren't reproduced. When you transplant a heart, you don't get the nervous system uh, connection, but you will still get some degree of the, the, the hormone response and uh, a transplanted heart will still respond to adrenaline and things like that. Whereas a, a, an artificial heart obviously doesn't have any of that uh, capability. It's uh, you know a clear intersection between physics, engineering, medicine. Um, I'm sure we will do it, but it's, it's quite sobering. If you go not far from here to the Science Museum in London, they've got one of the early prototypes uh, of, a, of a Jarvik heart, which was one of the companies that kind of uh, did a lot of the early work in this. It looks pretty much the same as, as the, the, the recent prototypes that we've got now. Um, and, and they're still really, really cumbersome, noisy things. So how, how long, in the best case, do people survive on these things? With a, uh, a total artificial heart, with no native heart, so their heart was completely removed, I think the longest is somewhere in the region of 600 plus days. Um, in Europe, and uh, certainly um, here in the UK, we don't uh, put the assist devices in as, as destination therapy. We only use them again to buy time before a transplant. Whereas in America, where you know money talks, um, they will put these ventricular assist devices in as the kind of end, the end treatment, and then the patient will will just die with that in. And I think some of those patients have gone on for quite a few years. But they, their hearts are still there. They're not, they haven't had their heart replaced entirely. Okay, so I have an even more serious question. Why do doctors use so many incomprehensible and unpronounceable, many syllable words? You see, we like to maintain an air of mystique and, and uh, we can't have the, the great unwashed understanding all these terms we talk about. We want to you know, keep ourselves a bit removed from, from everybody else. Oh, man, I'm only kidding. I mean, probably there is some truth to that uh, originally, I think. Um, it's like the priests in the Middle Ages. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, if you go back just a couple of hundred years, your chances with a priest versus a doctor were probably about the same. You know, a lot of it was just uh, religion in some ways. There's, there's a, a clearly a big hangover from uh, the classics and uh, most of Western medicine is is heavily um, drawn from Latin and Greek. So a lot of these terms are just complicated ways of, of saying high or low or big or small and just using the, the, the Greek and the um, uh, Latin terms for them. I personally feel like a, a real connection to a lot of that jargon. I actually feel it's, it's part and parcel of, of our history. Um, the problem I think arises is when we talk to one another uh, and we talk to patients in the same way. And I think that's the big mistake. So I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with the jargon or the complicated terms, and it's very useful having language we all understand within the field. But I, I wince, you know, when when I've I've heard doctors talking to patients with the same language because that's there's nothing clever about that. You're not there's no nothing to be gained from trying to uh, appear clever in front of a patient if they're not understanding you. And and we know from you know, analyzing patient consultations that patients come away not taking in the majority of, of what they've been told because it's just not explained clearly. So um, I like the complicated words. I think uh, when I'm in the company of very clever physicists, I can at least look a little smart by saying these, these long words, but uh, I think we just have to know when to use it. I think you guys could learn something from physicists because we have all the cool words. We have dark matter and black holes and spooky action at a distance. That's, that's, one, of the best. that's one of the best, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, why not? Let's start adopting them. I, I, I'm going to start referring to quantum medicine and uh, I'll, I'll package that uh, as maybe some sort of expensive treatment. And um, anything that I can't explain from now on, I'll just call dark. I'll, I'll, I'll say the dark forces have caused you to eat too many chips and have a heart attack. Zabina, thank you very much again for, for joining me. It really was a, an honor to uh, have this chat with you. 
For the second part in this two-part uh, video series, head on over to Zabina's channel where you'll find uh, me asking some daft questions about physics to her, as well as loads of other videos that I'm sure you'll enjoy.